This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by MacPaw, the makers of Clean My Mac X. Your Mac as good as new. Find out more at macpaw.com slash podcast. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, this is one, it's kind of a rare pleasure for me to welcome back Mr. Derek Story to Mac Voices. He hasn't been here for a while, even though every January we see each other at CES and every year we say, yeah, we got to get together and we never do because we're both so busy. Derek, it's great to have you. Thanks for being here. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad we get to check in online again, Chuck. This is a lot of fun. I know, I know. Well, it's and I'm glad we got to at least uh, say hello at, at CES in January. Yeah, because... you know, we uh, usually pass about the same place in the same aisle on the same night. <laughs> I guess we're creature of habits, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Either that, or we're being manipulated. But we won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, though, excited about this particular topic um, because you have created a new course that is uh, helps folks digitize their family memories. And I think this is a phenomenal thing, and we can talk more about why I think it's so phenomenal. But tell me about the course and what the inspiration was for it. So, you know, to be honest with you, uh, just like everyone else, this is something I had been procrastinating on for the longest time. Usually the photographers in the family are the ones that are, you know, dubbed the historians as well. So I had received pictures and all that kind of stuff and just hadn't done anything with them. And they were in the classic shoebox under the bed, right? Just like everyone else. So when we went into shelter in place and uh, I wasn't able to go out and do my outside assignments anymore or do my workshops, I thought, you know what? this is the time to tackle this. I mean, if there ever was a time to work on this project, it's now. And I thought what I would do is develop a best practices for the project while I did it myself, right? So, you know, I I was doing it along with everyone else uh, when I created the course. And uh, it turned out really fun. I mean, people are really enjoying it. There's four parts to it. And, you know, we'll cover some of the detail in a minute. But it really did come out of trying to be useful during this time that we're locked in. And, and this is such a great idea. We, I can't say that I'm a photographer of your, of your stripe, but <laughs> some, somehow all the photographs from my family sort of ended up in my care, custody, and control. And I realized that, first of all, there's, there's a great responsibility there from a history standpoint. There's also a great danger because if anything happens to me or my home – the history's gone, and by digitizing them and you know putting them somewhere that the 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 rest of the family, whether it's two others or twenty others, can get to, it preserves it, and it also lets you go back and and, and share it and enjoy those memories a whole lot more. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, the second part really is important as well because under your bed and they're not you know in your photos collection or in Lightroom then you're not able to enjoy them right you're not able to share them and you know part of what happens during this process is that both good and bad uh, these memories come flooding back or you learn something about a family member or something and it can be quite emotional and you know if they're under your bed you don't get the good or the bad uh, with those emotions and I, I think that's a shame you're you're right. You're right. I mean, under the bed, they're not doing anybody any good. <laughs> and until you go to something like lockdown, you know, you just never think, hey, this evening I'm going to go and look at some old family photos because there's always something else to do. This way, you right. can use them as a screensaver. You can you can command them to do a whole lot of different things at family events so much easier. And so it's really important. I mean, and now we have digital cameras, and it's a bit easier. Maybe it may. It also represents some challenges, but that's another discussion. But but having the the paper turning into digital images is just something that everybody should do. Like this weekend, right now, get it done. You won't be sorry. <laughs> so one thing that uh, I've been talking to people about about this project is that they're overwhelmed, right? You know, they have too many. And they just can't get their head around it. And I thought a lot about that before, you know, deci deciding on what the workflow is going to be. 
So one of the things that I do in the project and something I want to talk about right now to help with that is I recommend just starting with 100. 100 and, and I think snapshots are a good place to start. Save the film and slides for, you know, when you get your workflow a little bit more refined, but start with the snapshots because they're the easiest to digitize. And go through, just take a, a stack out of the box and just go through and do a yay nay on a bunch of them and pick a hundred that you want to work on as a starting point and then develop your workflow with that hundred. You know, you, because some things are going to work, some things aren't going to work. You know, you're going to have successes, you're going to have failures, you're going to discover stuff that you thought was going to be great that just isn't. And if you're only working with 100, which believe me, when you get about halfway through that, that 100 feels like a lot. Then when you get all the way to the end of the process, first of all, you have 100, right, which is more than you had before. But second of all, you've had a chance to work out your workflow without being overwhelmed. And then you can go back and get another 100 and then another 100, you know, that kind of thing and chip away at it. I mean, I think the best way to tackle a big project is to break it down into parts. And, you know, that is one of the cornerstones of, of the approach to this training, yeah. And one of the dangers I would think of that is that I get so hung up on that first hundred and and enjoying the memories that come from that first hundred that it, it takes that much longer to get to the second hundred, which is not that bad a thing, really, because you are getting to do that enjoyment that we're talking about. Exactly, exactly. And uh, you're right, that that does happen. <laughs> that does happen. Uh, I know for the 100 that I use, uh, my wife had been procrastinating on a bunch of stuff that she had. And I said, you know what, I'm going to do this for you. You know, this uh, we'll use your stuff and, and the boys and all that kind of thing. And so that you can have, you know, those images on your computer. And I put them in her photos library when we were done. But uh, it was really neat to sit down and look at those images with her and enjoy them. And uh, it's a big part of it. And I don't want to diminish that. You know, you don't want to, like, rush through it so that you don't get the pleasure of, you know, being reconnected with uh, friends and family over the years. So I, I should have brought, brought a prop, but I didn't. So I'm going to fake it. <laughs> but, so, so let's just pretend this is a snapshot. All right. So mm -hmm. walk me through without, we're not going to do the course here, obviously, but walk sure. me through what you're talking about doing with, with this snapshot. Yeah. So, you know, a big part of what needs to happen, in my opinion, happens even before digitizing. So, you know, after you've done the sort and you've got a stack of images that you want to work on, then I recommend that you do some research, right? <laughs> Find out what's going on in those images. And sometimes you'll know, and sometimes you'll need some help. And a lot of times I'll just use the post-it note, uh, write the information in the post-it note, stick it on the back of the print afterwards. So that, so that I have, have it together. And one is really just getting it, uh, you know, understanding what you have in those images. Because the reason why I say that is that when you get the scanning, depending on what you use, some scanning options allow you to add metadata during the scanning process. And that can save you a bunch of time. So if you kind of know that this group is, you know, this clan and this group is this clan and this happened at this date, you can do these small batches during your scanning, add some metadata while you're doing it. And then when you come out on the other end with the digitized images, you have less work to do. And so, you know, that is a big part of it. Then you actually do digitize. Then you have to figure out, you know, what are you going to use to organize them? I think uh, Lightroom Creative Cloud is a great choice because it allows you to change the timestamp, which is important because if you're scanning a picture from 1957, the date's going to be 2020, right? So you want to be able to change that. Lightroom allows you to do that easily. And I also like photos for Mac OS. And uh, another reason why both of those apps work for me is that they have cloud connectivity. So then instantly, you know, you can make them available to other people. So that is the final stage, which is, you know, organizing your catalog, do the finishing touches on the metadata, and, uh, you know, hopefully enjoying the process along the way. 
Well, there are a number of things I want to get to at this stage that I don't <laughs> want to forget. First of all, so the, the, you're talking about embedding the metadata in the photo. You're not talking about um, – are you talking about tags or are you talking about uh, – How do you have a naming convention that you prefer that might include some yeah, of the metadata? I just, I just use regular IPTC metadata. So, you know, title, description, keywords. That all works great, and uh, in both uh, Lightroom and Photos, you can, if you know the location, you can enter it in there, and you can add geotags, which is how cool is that, right? <laughs> Having the image geotagged as well. Uh, so yeah, I'm talking about just you know the basic stuff that a lot of times we would put in a photograph that we took today, you know. So, and that is so helpful uh, for people later on. If they can pull up the image and, you know, IPTC travels with the image, everyone, you know, all everything can read it. And for them to be able to read a short description that you put in in the title and even see the geotag from, you know, where uh, grandma's house was, you know, in the in the 70s. Uh, that's all great stuff. So you talk about the cloud connection. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be somebody like me that is just that much paranoid about putting my family <laughs> photos in the cloud. Should we should we be concerned about this? Um, and do you have a service that you prefer over another or some way to secure our photos? Well, I mean, that's a great question. I, my personal preference is iCloud. Um, I feel like Apple does a good job of securing that. And I feel very comfortable having you know my stuff there, uh, so uh, that's that's my primary area. Um, I do think though that Adobe does a good job with Creative Cloud as well, you know. So those are the you know the two services that that I rely on, and I think I think they're as good as any out there. Uh, beyond that, uh, if you wanted a, a whole separate thing, or if your workflow didn't involve Adobe or Apple then um, I don't have any recommendations, but you would want to do your research for sure. I, I admit to being, uh, having a preconception, I won't say biased, having a preconception that when you say Lightroom, I immediately think, okay, that's going to connect to Adobe Creative Cloud and that's where my photos are going to go. I hadn't even thought about the possibility of using Lightroom in conjunction with iCloud, which I'm with you. I feel a lot more secure about because of Apple's stance on privacy. Yeah, in that case, uh, for uh, for example, you could use Lightroom Desktop, right, to do your work. So that all stays on your hard drive. And then you can export uh, out of there in batch and have those uh, go into photos in iCloud or, you know, however you want to put them in the iCloud and bypass the whole Adobe service. So you can still have the benefits of Lightroom if you like it, but you don't necessarily have to connect to Creative Cloud unless you're using the Creative Cloud version of Lightroom. And then, you know, then obviously it is going to go straight into their cloud service. Right. Again, my prop. <laughs> Here's my photo. <laughs> how, how, a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful prop. <John. laughs> Thank you. So how are we scanning I this? Love are, are we using a flatbed or are we using let's say my iPhone or one of your DSLRs to take a picture of the picture, what's the best way to do this with something with, with gear we might have, or do we need to invest in something? Well, I cover all of that. I actually do. And you know, a big part of the training is to show you all the different options that you have available. Part of the assumption, realizing that you may still be sheltered in and have to use what you have. Right. So I wanted to make sure that we covered those options. Uh, for prints, you have some great options that range from your iPhone. There are some wonderful apps that I talk about that even allow you to you know, put four or five pictures on a sheet of white cardboard, and it will detect the individual pictures and give you individual files for them. Our flatbed scanners on these you know, very affordable multifunctional printers are quite good. The software is quite good. And uh, I use a, a Canon myself, a $69 Canon multifunction, and it detects objects as well. So I can put four prints on the flatbed scanner and end up with four very nice files. Uh, so, you know, that's another way to go. You have your uh, camera. 
Uh, I use the camera more for slides and negatives uh, than I do for prints. I think you know, prints are easier to do with a flatbed. And then I talk about one device that I love. It's a little bit more expensive, but Epson makes this beautiful uh, snapshot scanner called Fast Photo. And it plugs right into Photos for Mac OS if you want it to. It does image correction during the scanning process. It allows you to uh, add metadata during the scanning process. And it allows you to take a stack of these images and just put it in there. And it's just zoom, zoom, zoom. And uh, it's lovely too. So, you know, I cover all that kind of stuff to make sure that you have lots of different options. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by MacPaw, the makers of Clean My Mac X. Have you upgraded to Mac OS Catalina? Then you need Clean My Mac X. There are almost certainly files left over from your previous system that don't need to be there. Clean My Mac X can find them, let you know what they are and where they are, and help you get rid of them. If you haven't upgraded to Catalina, you need Clean My Mac X. It will help you optimize your Mac to run at its best, and when you are ready to upgrade, none of those old useless files will be transitioned over. In fact, whatever system your Mac is running, or whatever Mac you're running, Clean My Mac X will help you get it running at its best, and keep it running at its best. Get rid of all those outdated cache files, logs, and old email attachments. And don't worry. Clean My Mac X won't delete anything without you knowing about it and without your permission. Find out how it works by downloading your free trial of Clean My Mac X from macpaw.com slash podcast. That's macpaw.com slash podcast, M-A-C-P-A-W dot com slash podcast for your free trial of Clean My Mac X. Give your Mac a performance upgrade with Clean My Mac X at macpaw.com slash podcast. Thanks to Mac Paul for their support of Mac Voices. Okay, so it's story time. I <laughs> you're about twelve years, thirteen years late with this. This to help me because about the, about that long ago, I've I took all of our family photos, and I have I have a photo somewhere of my then dining room table, like two feet deep in in stacks of photos. Right. I, I had elected at that point because, frankly, the hardware was either not unobtainable, but it was extremely expensive at that time. And the technology was not for the home was not as good unless you were really into photography. So I chose a scanning service. They required mm -hmm. me to sort all the photos out into different sizes. And, you know, that's and of course, I had no idea going back in from the the then whatever that was to, you know, back into the fifties or, or earlier, how many different formats and sizes of photos. Oh <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was crazy. And so, you know, and, and I sent them off and, and what I got back was on uh, DVDs and, and it was great because it, it may not have given me everything that you're talking about. And I've tried to add some stuff along the way, but most importantly, it preserved those photos. It got them into digital form where they could be shared and all. So, so, how do you feel about the scanning services at this stage of the game? Well, I think uh, you know there are some very good ones, and I like them. And uh, I think they're a good way to go, especially if you don't have the gear or you don't, uh, you know, want to do the scanning yourself. However, you know, you plug the scanning service in you know, to the appropriate place in the workflow. In other words, just using a scanning service doesn't mean that you don't have to organize before, not only by size, like you talked about, but you really want to kind of get your metadata in order. You want to do your research. You want to, you know, do batch uh, scanning so that you don't have a thousand come back. Because what happens is when they come back in digital form, if you haven't done any organization, you haven't done any work, then you're just really moving the mess from under your bed onto your computer. And a lot of times, people will become overwhelmed on the computer and they won't sort them out and they won't get them organized and they won't add the information that they should because they're overwhelmed. So, and the analogy I use is that, you know, when we move from one house to another in our personal life, it's an opportunity to thin and clean, you know, as we move out of one house and move into the other, which is what I recommend with the metadata and organizing and scanning. You know, you don't want to just pick up the, the dirty laundry from one house and bring it into the other house. That, that seems like a shame. 
came. So, and I'm way uh, about this. So scanning services are great, but you still want to do the key parts of the workflow so that it's uh, as efficient as it can be. Yeah. Folks, please take Derek's advice because I made, <laughs> I made that mistake and I ended up with about 18,000 photos that oh. needed to be gone through. You know, again, I mean, don't misunderstand. I've, I'm, I'm delighted that I did it because they were preserved. Because some, some of them, I guess, the they had, depending on which ones they were, they had started to fade and crack. Mm -hmm. And at least they were preserved. But it did leave yeah. me with that mess you're talking about. And, and it's, I mean, on the upside, it caused me to go through and try to identify people and places and, you know, organize and, and do some metadata things. But... All the all the all the little things you're saying you should do this you should do that, I completely overlooked or just didn't know, and so that's why I think this course is so valuable for someone who's just starting to go down this road. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about the the course. So uh, what we do is that we have the the movies on Vimeo. You know they're password protected, all that, but. Uh, what I like about it is that we also have comments with each of the four movies, you know, for the different phases of the workflow. And so people thought of stuff and, and added stories like you are or had questions or whatever. And so that lives on. So that's always there. So, for instance, the folks that come to the course now get the benefit from the folks that have been there before and, you know, already asked questions and had them answered and so forth. So it kind of keeps growing because every scenario is a little bit different. You know, your experience is uh, a little different than mine and, and it goes on and on. And it's kind of fun to see how people tackle this stuff. Derek, um, do you tackle video at all? I mean, we're talking about digitizing things and sort of by, by its nature today, that's more digital asset management. But a lot of us yeah. have old eight millimeter, in my case, sixteen millimeter video from my family of of my family from way back. And that's something that I have no idea how to approach at this point. <laughs> yeah, i I consider that a different title to tell you the truth. And uh, in when I was working on this title, uh, I researched that and just <laughs> got, and it was pretty early in my research. I go, no, this is a <laughs> this is a separate animal right here. Uh, I will tell you this though that one of the things that I came across in my research is that this uh, device that uh, Kodak makes called a uh, Kodak Scanza, which is about a hundred and fifty dollar little scanner, and you know we use it. Uh, is one of the things I demo in this because it does a great job with negatives and slides, but they also have the ability to do eight millimeter too. So uh, I go, okay, uh, duly noted. Um, I'm going to come back to that. But yeah, uh, boy, I think you know, video, video is a whole different ball game even in the modern age right now. You know, uh, digital video and so forth. But scanning eight millimeter and doing stuff with that, yeah, that's a separate course. Okay. <laughs> that is a separate course. <laughs> well, well, then you have to come back when you put that course together and tell us about it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, you mentioned that you use your phone for s slide scanning. Um, mm -hmm. So is are there special attachments that you use for that? What makes the phone a, a better option for that than the phone, say, for um, for a snapshot? Well, you can use it for both. It, it works, uh, the phone works for both. And I tell you, you know, especially those of us that use iPhones, you know, the cameras are good. The computers in them are good. And, you know, people writing software for them are pretty good too. So it, it's a great combination. And I think that if you get the right software, you know, which I talk about some of my favorites, uh, it's actually a pretty good workflow. For me personally, uh, for both snapshots and uh, slides and negatives, I prefer different devices if I have them available. For instance, I love a flatbed scanner for snapshots because it's just faster. <laughs> it's just faster, you know. Just put them down on the glass, close the lid, hit the button, and off to the races you go. And it, if you, once you have it set up, it really does all the work. Whereas I think with the phone, you have to fiddle a little bit more. And because the phone, a lot of times, trying to correct for the angle that you're holding the phone and stuff, uh, you, you get some software irregularities sometimes. You know, there, there's 
there are compromises to all. But the reason why I talk about the phone is that if you don't have the other things, if you don't have flatbed, if you don't have a digital SLR with a, or a mirrorless with a macro lens, it's a good option that at least allows you to digitize the images, kind of like what you talked about with your first batch that you sent out. At least then you can say they're digitized, right? I can always come back when I get different equipment or if I want to revisit it or if I want to pick a few favorites out and you know do something special with them. But at least get some, you know, uh, out of the shoebox and onto your computer. And, you know, for that reason alone, I think it's worth talking about some of the software that works with the phone. Okay. I, and I, I'm bouncing all around, but things occur to me that you had said. Right. Um, the, the, the Canon scanner that you're using, the flatbed, are you using just mm -hmm. their software or is there a commercial software that you're using commercialize in a third party piece of software that makes the scanning easier or, or facilitates it? No, I'm just using their software and their driver and it, and it works great. And I've tested it with uh, Epson as well. And, uh, you know, both of them, I, you know, I have to say I'm fairly impressed with the software drivers, uh, Canon, Epson in particular. Uh, I had an HP uh, that I used for a long time and its software was good. The drivers that come with it are are fairly excellent. Yeah, so you, nothing extra there I needed. Well, I'm really glad to hear that because I know that. Um, I guess it, was it was I'm not sure if it started with Mavericks or Catalina, but you know, soft, the the drivers for some of the older scanners started to drop off, and yeah, yeah, you know, everybody nobody wants to give up that piece of hardware that has worked for them in the past. In this case, it may be a good idea because the the newer scanners not only is the software compatible, but I think the whole the whole process has evolved and the hardware has gotten better. So don't, don't rule that out. I don't think. Yeah, I mean it's really uh, you can just turn on if you have a current uh, multifunctional thing. This we'll just stick with Canon for now because I'm most familiar with it. Uh, you can just sit on your couch with your uh, you know laptop open and throw some things on the scanner and then open it up. You can do it either through the, uh, the print and system preferences. You know, there's two tabs when you go to printer uh, for your, uh, one is for printing and the other one is for scanning. This says scan right there on the tab. You click on it and it, it, there's all your scanning stuff right there. It activates the scanner. You can do it wirelessly. You don't have to be connected via USB. Uh, it's really, really convenient i have to say these little devices by the way uh you know the multifunction printers that you get for less than 100 bucks they're they're really kind of cool and for a lot of stuff that you would do around the home office they're very handy tools yeah yeah and and if it's folks if it sounds like you know well that's a hundred dollars here a hundred dollars there I'm, yeah. I, the, the good news about the scanning services services are that they're convenient um, to, mm -hmm. to do a lot quick, but kind of the bad news is they're not inexpensive. So don't over don't don't look at a yeah. hundred or two hundred dollar scanner that and and you do the work and you have some of the benefits that Derek's talking about. Um, that's that's not a replacement, not going to be replaced, I should say, by the scanning services. So they're kind of two different animals for two different things, but. One way or another, this is going to be a process that's going to, A, take a long time, and B, is going to cost a little money. But, man, is it worth it. Uh, you just have you have no idea how many times you will be able to put your photos to use that before you would have never even thought about doing it because they were hiding under your bed. Yeah, and remember that multifunctional device, you can make prints with it, too, which is you know <laughs> kind of cool. So uh, let's say that you scan a print from 1950 and uh you know so you do it on the flatbed there and you touch it up a little bit which is so easy to do you can just use photos or lightroom for that touch it up a little bit sharpen it a little bit and then you can make a a, a fine art card with it or you know make a, a nice print and it could be a gift to somebody so it's not only you know the digital aspect of digitizing it you have it so you can work on it and you can make as many copies as you want and do all sorts of different things. You can make a calendar that has, you know, all these family memories. Uh, imagine how that would go over at the uh, holiday season. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do here. 
that's a, that's a great point. And you're right. You know, you, you've said it a couple of times and it's gone by me that we're talking, you're talking about the multifunction devices, not just a dedicated mm -hmm. scanner. So, Oh yeah. Um, and the resolution of those is more than good enough, especially for old snapshots. Oh yeah. It's, it's, I tell you the, you know, the 65, $75 multifunctional, uh, device that you know scans and prints and does other stuff yeah those things are a bargain you know obviously we know the ink is you know where they hope to really make their money on that but the device itself not bad yeah and here you know with with the projects we're talking about there's no ink no uh-uh except for the occasional print that you want to make and put on the mantle <laughs> right, right. Derek, any other any other gotchas? I guess it, as you went through, um, I've described some of mine. I've and and you've described mm -hmm. a few. Any others that folks should be aware of before they start contemplating this process and go looking for your for your course? Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to reiterate the idea that you don't have to conquer the entire mountain, you know, first time through. It's it's okay to to do it in bits and pieces. It's okay to, uh, you know, take a hundred and, and really do what you want. The one thing, though, that I will say is that as you work your way through it, once you've scanned something or once you've digitized it, then it should go in a separate container, right? Don't, don't, don't put it back in with the other <laughs> ones, right? Or you can, you can make a mess. So, you know, have, you know, of course, I cover all that stuff, but, you know, Part of the workflow is if it's been digitized, then it, it goes somewhere else. And uh, I think that's really important. <laughs> yeah, and it's probably worth saying, too, that it should it should go somewhere that is fairly secure. I'm not sure that you need to yeah. go to the bank and buy a safe deposit box. You probably yeah. can't afford something that large. But, um, you know, get it in something that is maybe can be sealed and is waterproof and, you know, whether basement, attic, wherever. But. To, to preserve those photos, yeah, they're digitized, but you want to try to have the originals if at all possible. The originals are cool, I have to say. I mean, yeah. I do thin out and I do throw stuff away because just like any other photo shoot, you're not going to keep every little thing, right? Some stuff just needs to go away. We're talking about inferior cameras. We're talking about a lot of times family snap shooters. You know, there's some ugly stuff in there, you know, so I think it's okay to let that go. But the stuff that's the good stuff, the stuff that, you know, is worth digitizing is probably worth hanging on to the originals as well. Yeah. Yeah. So where do we go to get the course? How much is it? How does, what are the logistics of this? Yeah. So, you know, everything now in terms of my, my training is on the nimble photographer.com all one word, the nimble photographer. And you just go to workshops because now I have, physical workshops there. And then I have the online workshops. Uh, digitizing is uh, there. Uh, I have a new one that's uh, coming out right now on how to video conference like a pro because, well, you know, that's kind of important these days too. So I, I go through, you know, lighting, I go through the camera, I go through audio, which is super important backdrop, lighting, <laughs> you know, all that good stuff. So uh, that's going to be there. And then um, in the queue, uh, one on podcasting is coming up. And I'm also working on one for digitizing your CDs before they go bad so that you make sure that you have that uh, preserved as well. So there's going to be lots going on there. Just go to thenimblephotographer.com and click on workshops and uh, you'll see whatever's going on at the moment. Great. Oh, um, and the course is $39 uh, right now. But if you want, I can create a discount code for your listeners and you could put that in the show notes. That'll, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. So do that. We're, okay. Do that. So do you want to say it here and, or put it in the show notes? What, what do you prefer? Um, yeah. So I can uh, give you the discount code right now. Okay. It'll be D. FM 15 and that'll give you a 15% discount. And there's a, there's a, you know, place that you get to enter the code right there at checkout. Okay. So DFM 15 and folks, mm -hmm. uh, and Derek, I'll ask you right here on camera. I'm, I tend, 
I, I always am never sure about putting things on in show notes because that means somebody can scrape it and take the code. So if you're comfortable with that, I'll put it there. If not, right. you know, then they'll have to listen or watch this to uh, to get that code. But so check. You the can show put notes. it everywhere. I can put it everywhere. Okay. You can put it everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's it's for our audience here, obviously. Uh, right. You know, don't tweet it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. 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 I, I have but yeah, to... DFM, which stands for dig Digitizing Family Memories, DFM 15 will get you a 15% discount. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I have to, I have yeah. to ask about the podcast. You, you continue to roll that out. I do. Uh, the Digital Story at thedigitalstory.com and on Apple Podcasts and everywhere else you listen to your show is doing great. Uh, I'm at uh, 700 and some odd episodes now every Tuesday. Uh, the show is very popular. It has a strong uh, Patreon base. You know, I have a great inner circle that supports it. Um, and we're just like the show that's live right now, as you and I record this, is on, you know, tips for video conferencing, you know, so that you look good, how to use your digital camera and things like that. And I just try to stay current in what's going on and really give people, you know, helpful things so that, you know, they take better pictures, record better audio, and just have a better experience with all these tools. Yeah. And I feel like every time, I, every episode I listen to, I learn a little something. It may be it may be a reminder of something I th I knew, or more often yeah. than not, it's you yeah. know it's just something I didn't know. So I've learned a lot of photography from you, and and I appreciate that. So I I would encourage everyone to go check out uh, the Digital Story podcast. And I appreciate you saying that because that's that's why I'm here, and hopefully to entertain a little bit as well, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um. You know, I also would be remiss if I didn't talk or ask a little bit about the uh, the physical workshops. I know that mm -hmm. the 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 lockdown has kind of curtailed those. Do you have a time frame for bringing those back online, or is it dependent on what what California does? Yeah, man, it's been very interesting, Chuck. I have to tell you that <laughs> whole thing. So uh, I had to cancel the one in Humboldt Redwoods in May, uh, and actually we postponed it. And uh, then I also had to uh, postpone the one up at uh, Lake Almanor and Lassen Volcanic Park for July. California's just not quite ready yet. Uh, you know, and the county uh, where the workshop takes place has a lot to do with, you know, what we can do and what we can't do there. So that one um, is postponed as well. I have one on the book still for Eastern Sierra in October. I'm crossing my fingers for that one. I would love to do it just because, you know, we're all getting a little batty uh, here. <laughs> you know, photographers like to go outside and take pictures. So I'm hoping that one uh, will come off. And then I'm already working on the 2021 workshop season. And uh, I anticipate we'll be able to have a full season in 2021. Good. Kind of pick up where we left off. So, yeah, uh, my... My best bet right now is the October one, and then uh, 2021. I, I really feel like we're going to be able to get out and get some fresh air. And and I I love the way that you have structured these because you don't just take as many people as will sign up. You have a set mm -hmm. number, and this is it. And that way, you know, you have a, a core, nice core group that is getting your attention and getting the instruction. And you've made these things into little mini events that I, I think yeah. it's a phenomenal way to approach it. It's all about quality, right? It's all about quality experience. And if you find that magic size for the group, which I think I have, then the group becomes one, you know, and that's what's important, you know, where it's not, you know, splintering off into subgroups. You, you know, you have one group that's working together, that's eating together and living together and, you know, having a great time taking pictures and viewing each other's pictures and making them better. Uh, I just love that feeling. And, you know, I like that part, Chuck, as much as I do being in a beautiful place to tell you the truth, you know, hanging around the workroom during the workshop while we're doing lab or whatever, and listening to all the crosstalk and people work on stuff. I love that. That's a blast. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I miss it so much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, hopefully we'll get, we'll all get back to uh, something that looks a little more normal soon. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Yeah. 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 
Well, thank you so much for coming and uh, and telling us about this. I'm I'm just delighted, and and I really I, again I encourage everyone to go get the course because Derek will help you avoid the pitfalls that I fell down. Every single one of them. I think he mentioned I I made the mistake. The only thing I did right was getting the photos digitized, and this way yeah. you, know, you can do it right. So, thank you. Thank you, Chuck. It's uh, always great to talk to you. And uh, I don't know if we're going to get to see each other in Las Vegas in January, but I'm going to cross my fingers. I I hope so. I hope so. But if not, anytime you you have anything, please come back and tell us about it. We all want to know. All right. Good to all see right. you. I'd love to. Take care. All right. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Once again, go get Derek's course. Get your photos digitized. With a little luck, maybe you're starting to come out of lockdown. But even if you're not, this is a project that you can do over the summer into the winter. Take a, take 100 or so and just get started. But you will not regret it. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.